on your machine, if eTabs has been installed in addition to Revit structure, there will be an external tools menu. Okay, now, if you don't have eTabs installed on your machine, you can get it installed on your machine because you can download it from our server and you can put it on your machine. And on Ubuntu, I actually have a whole listing of exactly what you need to do to get eTabs and Revit structure in place and working together so that they can transfer information. Because basically what you have to do is put eTabs on your machine if you want to run it separately, or it's always on these machines. But I think, did a lot of you install that for your Steel Plus? So a lot of you already have it on your machines, okay? Then there's this final thing called the Revit eTabs or CSI Revit connector. You can put that on there, and all it really does is put these menu choices in here. So if those aren't showing up, you just need to sort of install this eTabs connector, the CSI Revit connector. But what it does is as follows. You can say, export this Revit model to make an eTabs model out of it. What it's going to do is take a look at this structure and just say, hey, Given the structure, let me kind of take a look, see what's going on. I'll kind of take stock of what's happening here. And after it goes through and looks at all 2,900 elements that are in there, it'll basically say, OK, I found some things that might be interesting. <coughs> in fact, I found four grid lines, five frames, three footings, two point loads, two line loads, and a one load combo. OK, so if I'd like to take that information and take it over to eTabs, I can say OK and then I can put it somewhere. I'm gonna put this actually just in my documents folder locally. It seems like it doesn't really like it if I put it on the file server, so I'm gonna put it here. I think my file server name got too long. Something about the path name was long. Okay, so this is gonna be class two export from Revit. It's an EXR file. What's an EXR file? It's really like a little text file that just contains information describing this in a way that um, eTabs can understand. So what I'm gonna do is just hide away that for now, and I'll open up eTabs instead. And let me uh, say that I'm going to import. Is there a different version for eTabs available? Um, it's uh, the, 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 the main version's available. We can download it from the K drive, and you can install it on your machine. So we're licensed here at Stanford to do that. Oh. So if you want to put that on there, you know, again, I'll, I can send you out a link to set, describe the process. In other words, and if you're on the VPN, that's the restriction. You have to be on the, uh, somewhere on the Stanford network mm -hmm. to access it. Okay, let's go ahead and import. I'm going to import the Revit structure EXR file. It's going to ask me a little bit about, oh, where it is. There it is, a few moments ago. It's going to say, great, I found some stuff in there. What units do I want to use? Actually, hang on. I put them right on top of each other. Let me say new. That's a little ugly because I put them right on top of each other. Let me say start with the default one and cancel out of there. Okay. New blank model. Import. Again, I'll go out there and grab that EXR file. That's the one I just found right there. We are hanging in eTabs. This is basically that same structure, just as it appears in eTabs. We have the little line model that's kind of looking at all the different elements. The grid lines came in. Yeah, we basically have the same model to work with over here. So, so far, all we've really done is transferred the geometry and the loading that we defined over in Revit here. Once we're in eTabs, though, at this point, we're just really using eTabs the way we normally do. There's <coughs> nothing special about what's going on here. This is eTabs the way you know it. So. We can take a look at these little conditions down here at the bottom in terms of, oh, what's going on there at the feet. Yes? Oh, actually, that I didn't. Let me go ahead and do that for you so that you can grab it too. Let me uh, do that for you here. We'll say export to create a new ETAS model. I could have copied that too. Twenty nine hundred units. Okay, say okay. And let me save that on the L drive for you too. So out there in uh, the class session files, session seventeen, structure class two. Okay, export from Revit 
two e tabs. Okay, so that one should be out there for you too. So back over to e tabs. We're hanging out here in e tabs, and you guys are actually probably much better at using e tabs than I am. So I am just going to do a little fumbling around, and you can tell me how wrong I am in terms of working with this. So I got the uh, little model kind of hanging around over there. In terms of the little model, I can do things like to show the member sizes and things like that. I've learned how to do that. So for example, if I want to see what the member sizes are, I can go to this thing called set the building view options. And I can say turn on the, is it uh, the line sections? Okay. And then it'll actually show me what the different section names are. Again, that information is the sizes that came out of Revit, these 10 by 49s as the columns and these 12 by 26s, which I put in there, the wide plan sec sections. That's kind of just the member information. In terms of these like, little boundary conditions, in terms of all you ETABs folks, are those like fixed or what are those? You know, they have all these little sort of, there's triangles, there's little crosses, there's all these like different symbols, depending upon what these boundary conditions are like, and that's really what it's translating them into. Okay, in terms of doing an analysis, oh, there's so much, this is like this incredible tool that I know so narrow a slice about. But what I will do is basically say that I'm going to analyze it. And that's an interesting structure. I can actually sort of tell by looking at this, it's simply supported over here. Over here, it's got that moment connection. That's why it actually sort of stayed like 90 degrees. So I bet it's transferring moment across here. That's fixed. They are fixed at the bottom, but see how they're all kind of flopping over. You know, they got a lot of interesting stuff going on. This is the deformed shape. That's a grossly deformed version, a gross version of the deformed shape, but that's kind of the deformed shape. But we can take a look at sort of that deflected shape and look at these members and really start to understand, given these loading conditions, really with the shear and bending moment diagrams is on each of those. So ultimately, we can figure out how we need to size things. So let me go make it an undeformed shape again. Okay. And we'll take a look at how we do that. For example, one thing we can do is turn on these, oh, just show me the shear and bending moments. Okay. So for those different elements, you can sort of see that's where that little uh, moment transfer connection was happening. So we got the negative moment there. That one's simply supported. And it's got some magnitude kind of hanging around there. If I shift it over instead to, let me go ahead and show the shears. Okay, that's, oh, I should comment on this. It's only showing us the dead load case right now. It's not showing us the live load case. And okay. You got to help me in terms of switching between the different cases. It's not there. Where is there? There's like got to be some pull down where I switch between the different like loading cases. Uh, display. Display. Uh, ah. And then. It's up in here. We can actually or what? Oh, that's okay. That'll show. Okay, that'll show the loads. Hang on. But hang on. How about in terms of which loads to actually include in the analysis? Try it in there. Set dynamic. No, it's not in there. I got to play with this. Actually, let me show you the other way where if I look at an individual member, I think I can get it to change it over there. But basically, this is just the dead loads. We would go through and start switching between the different load cases. So we can look at only the live loads, only the dead loads, or, or our LFRD case with the 1.2 and the 1.6 and try and like uh, get that to display instead. What I do, and I, again, I'm not very efficient in terms of working with ETABs, is I can choose a member like that. And if I right click on it, I can get back to, this is actually the shear and bending moment diagram. So there's the actual loading diagram and the shear and the bending moment diagram, and that's the deflection. If I go switching around between there and I say, show me the live loads instead, doesn't look like there's any live load on that one. The LFRD combo, that's the one we defined over there. So now we have the point loads as well as the bending moments and all, yeah, it's basically showing us all the basic essential information. So right now, it's kind of highlighting the maximum value. If I wanted to go through and pull, I could sort of figure out what the shear and bending moment or the deflection is at any point. Okay. 
And in terms of actually designing with this, there's a couple of different things to be looking at. One is this whole notion of really how the shear and the bending moment are st staticking up against the section modulus and the area of the beams themselves. Make sure we're not having some sort of local failure based on the materials properties. Another thing we might look at as a structural engineer is just this whole issue of the deflection. So it's deflecting 0.13 inches in the middle of that beam, which is actually, that's you know, it's significant. I don't know, it's something. What you got to always think about is really how, high, how big that is relative to uh, the total length of the beam. And we use different criteria. We use things like L over 360 or L over 480 as different, what we consider to be allowable deflection criteria. Because everything will deflect a little bit just because you have some dead load that's kind of just there and it's, it'll deflect some. And the question is really do we need to sort of size up or change our beams relative to what we're seeing in here. So for that part, now I'm going to stay out of that issue in terms of the design side, in terms of these beams and what's going on and whether they're big enough or not. Because if you're into working with uh, like the structural analysis tools, you'll be able to figure out basically you know, how these things need to change, which, which of these different beams might need to change relative to the loads that are on them. But let's show you what you do in terms of actually changing them if you've decided you want to change one. So for example, if I decide that I want to go through and change one of these beams because, oh, I looked at sort of the deformed shape. Where is it? There. Okay, and that was looking a little too deformy for me. Actually, that's, that's grossly exaggerated. That's not really fair. But let me pop back over here. And I decided that based on my analysis, a few of these things wanted to change. For example, this doesn't want to be a 12 by 26. It wants to be something, oh, a little bit taller, maybe 18 inches tall. And maybe this one wants to be 24 inches tall, something like that. But somehow in my analysis, I figured that out. What you can do over here is we have to unlock the structure because we're going to make a change to it. I can choose that element. And I can say assign and, oh, where is it? No, there it is. That's the frame section. Then I can choose a different section to put in there. So as opposed to 12 by 26, I said I was going to put some sort of 18 high member in there. This one over here, I decided, oh, after my analysis, I wanted that one to be a little bit bigger too. So I'm going to again say, Pop, pop, pop. I want that one. You. Assign. Frame section. Let's make that one even bigger. And again, I'm just choosing sort of large sizes. I'm just making these very large because I want you to be able to see the difference. Not that these are actually based in any sort of reality. Okay. So I've ended up changing a uh, column. I have this changed over here. I have that one changed over there. Those two are the same right now. They haven't changed at all. Okay, so I've done my analysis. I've decided that I need to go through and change my structure. I've made some changes to my structure. And the idea is what we can do now is let me export it. I'm going to export the Revit structure file. And what this is going to do is take these results, what I've done over here, and just bring it back into a form that can update the Revit file. So I'll update an existing Revit model as opposed to creating a brand new one. I'm going to put this first out in my little documents library just so I can get to it easily. Then I'll put it on the L drive for you. OK, uh, let me send the job from eTabs <coughs> with updates. OK, that was easy. Let me do the same thing for you guys. I'm going to say again, save that out. And I'll put that on the L drive for you guys. And we'll come over here and up there. Class session two. There you go. Export from eTabs with updates. Oh, come on. <laughs> what did I do? Export. Let's try it again. I wonder if it's just too long a name. ETAP seems to be pretty fussy about the, lo the length of the names. I'm going to try this again. So L drive, that's kind of Try ETAB, so I'll try that. Well, it doesn't like that either. It just doesn't like my file server for some reason. Let's try something. And may I have something to do with this, the path name in the file? Because I know I have some spaces and dashes in there. 
Let me just try e tabs export. <laughs> nope, it's not liking it. So give me a buy on that one. Let me import it in there. Y you'll imagine this is happening. I'll, I can copy it over uh, just as a, like a finder copy, something like that. I'm not sure why eTabs is not so happy about saving that out to the file server. Anyway, I am back over here. Here I am in my Revit file. I have uh, saved all that stuff out. I made some changes over in eTabs. I would love to go out there and grab all those changes and put them back in here so that I don't have to go through and kind of get a listing of the changes then make the changes manually because there might have been 100 beams that changed and I'll miss one and then I'll have a big lawsuit with a structural engineer because I didn't copy it and transcribe it right. I want to get it to happen automatically. So how do we make that happen? I'll just shade that so we can start to see a little bit better. And I'll even turn off that. Okay, let's come on down. We're going to do a re-import. But before we do the re-import, let me give you sort of a kind of tip that will make it go a whole lot faster. When you import, it actually does this thing where it goes through and looks at every element in the model here and sees, have you changed? Have you changed? Have you changed? And the deal is, like 3,300 of them later, you get tired of waiting for it because it takes like five or 10 minutes to go through and do that. So there's a quicker way of doing it. And that is, if you go through and just select some elements, and I'm going to select all the structural framing, or if I wanted to, I could go ahead and just grab all those. That'll work too. But what I want to do is select some elements. It'll only choose those elements to check, as opposed to selecting these. So it'll go a lot quicker. OK, so yeah, watch out for that. There's always a shortcut. OK, let me come back over into add-ins. I will say import it to update the existing Revit model from eTabs. <laughs> Let's go on out. I will go out to my documents folder where I put that thing. Return to Revit. Was that it? Around one? No. Class two export from Revit? No. Export from e Oh, that's it. 221. Say OK to that. It'll try to read the file. Let's see if it'll make any sense of it. Cross your fingers. Don't crash on me now. It's just, oh, there we go. OK, it's found some different things. We'll say OK to that. And here's the one to watch out for right here. Don't just hit start. Hit Revit Structure Selected Objects Only. Because then it'll go through and just find those things. Say OK. That's OK. And when it comes back in here, cross your fingers. Ooh, check that out. I got big chunky beams and big chunky columns that came out of eTabs. And that's really what I wanted. So what's the upshot of all this? It's basically build your basic model, send it over to eTabs, engage your structural engineer in trying to help you figure out what the sizes are. But then when the structural engineer figures out the right sizes and sends them back, you as the designer can just pull them back in. And hopefully they're all good. And your model will update itself nicely relative to those things. Okay, So this is that whole thing where you know they make the changes. It turns out now they're conflicting with all your ducks. And we have, a, again, an interesting discussion to go through in terms of trying to figure out where the conflicts are. And at that point, we can decide that, you know, maybe he needs to come up with another strategy to reduce those. Maybe we need to put another column in here. At this point, you know, there's a lot of different options we can use to go ahead and try and resolve these conflicts. But that's where, you know, your intuition and expertise as designers comes in. It, it's just good at doing calculations and hopefully you know, automating that so that you don't have to worry about them in too much detail. Okay, let us break for now. Go on and stand up, stretch, kind of come back in five minutes. And when you come on back, we're going to talk a little about energy and like how we can do a similar sort of thing in terms of getting our model out and getting some energy analysis results back. <laughs>